it's the next level. You took the short path. You cheated, Diana. That is the truth. That is the only truth, and truth is all there is. But I would have won if you didn't. But you didn't. You cannot be the winner, because you are not ready to win. And there is no shame in that. Only in knowing the truth in your heart, and not accepting it. No true hero is born from lies. Your time will come, Diana. When? When you're ready. Look to the Golden Warrior, Steria. She did not become a legend out of haste. She did it through true acts of bravery. Like patience. Diligence and the courage. Welcome back to the show, panelers. I'm Mark. I'm Laura. And this week, we decided to have Laura on because we, we have this Wonder Woman movie that came out. Wonder Woman 1984 is what we're discussing. It's been out for, uh, what, a week and a half, two weeks? Mm -hmm. Right after Christmas. Yeah, Christmas Day it launched, and, you know, we all had a good time. We're all anticipating it. That was the most anticipated movie to come out. I was looking forward to, <laughs> for it to come out in the summer and it never came. They kept delaying it, telling us we're going to get it this year, like 2021. But then I guess uh, Warner Brothers decided to side with uh, HBO Max and same day release within theaters and do a Christmas day as well as HBO Max. So I was able to see the movie, get my thoughts my opinions, a lot of people are out there are torn between it. A lot of people love it. A lot of people hate it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why Lara's here, because we need a lady's point of view. <laughs> and uh, on top of that, you know, I'm a little bit torn. I'm not saying I hated it, and I'm not saying I loved it. So you'll hear my thoughts overall in general. Steve's not able to be with us, but he did send in feedback. So we'll play that towards the end so you get his thoughts and points on the movie itself. And with that, we're, we're just going to begin. So basically, the synopsis for Wonder Woman 1984 is Wonder Woman squares off against Maxwell Lord and the Cheetah, a villainous who possesses superhuman strength and agility. So they made this ver this synopsis very vague on IMDb when it first <laughs> was released. So especially since it's a new movie. And, you know, we're, we're just going to move on. Our first impression, our thoughts when we went in and Lara would like you to give yours first. Okay, sure. Yeah, um, basically my background with Wonder Woman is that I grew up in the late 70s, early 80s. So probably around the age of seven or eight, I watched the Wonder Woman TV series with Linda Carter and yes. was so in love with it. Like every little girl of that time, I would spin around on the playground and try to turn my, my regular clothes into Wonder Woman's fabulous star-spangled uniform. and um, in the 80s, I read the George Perez comic book version of Wonder Woman. It was really great. I was really into that one. Didn't read much after that, but um, have been picking up some of the newer releases that are coming out. But yeah, I loved the first Wonder Woman movie. I felt they finally had brought her to life on the big screen the way I wanted to see her. Just, you know, compassionate, but strong and intelligent. So I was, like you, really, really looking forward to this sequel. And it takes place in the 80s. So <laughs> if anyone, I was the target demographic for this movie. You know, grew up with Wonder Woman, read the Wonder Woman comics, was <laughs> alive in the 80s and had that whole nostalgia going for me. But really on first watch... I was with some family members. We were watching that after Christmas. And I think it was 
mo- mainly because I was watching it with them and they were, some of them hadn't even seen the first movie. A lot of them weren't really that familiar with Wonder Woman. They just thought it would be kind of a fun movie to watch together. So we watched it and some of them started to fall asleep and just, they weren't really excited about it. So I think that brought my anticipation down a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there were issues that I took with it too, which I'll go into later. But I did do a second watch before the podcast by myself. And on second watch, I enjoyed it more and um, was able to just enjoy the parts that I was having hangups with because, you know, of (laughs) other people's reactions to it. Yeah. Well, like you, I, I watched it, I believe, that Christmas Day and the first watch. And my first impression or response was that was pretty good. Not what I was expecting based on the hype, but also for the fact that, you know, I saw the first Wonder Woman movie in the drive-in during the summer when it came out, and I loved it. There, I had a, maybe a few issues at the very end of that particular movie in the from the antagonist and what they did in it, but mm-hmm. overall, I loved the movie. And with that, it made me long for the sequel, and when I heard it, too, is 1984, that's our demographic. I was born in the 70s. We were born in the same year, mm-hmm. and I did grow up on the Wonder Woman and uh, Incredible Hulk action hour, as they call it, because they put Wonder Woman, and then they put the Incredible Hulk. And with that, I loved Linda Carter as a kid and was anticipating all this stuff because of Wonder Woman. I never really followed the comic line. I would grab a couple of issues here and there. I remember the big parts that she played in Crisis on Infinite Earths and a, and a few other issues that I got independently, just single issues. And I don't know which runs they were. It was during the mid-80s and then into the 90s eventually. But I'm thinking the reason why I wasn't so happy with it, maybe it was because I saw it at home. And not in Mm -hmm. front of a in a theater or something or on a big screen. But after my second thought, I thought it was still really good. I didn't think it was great. There are things that I love about the movie, and a few few things that I just don't. It didn't round out like the first movie. It Mm -hmm. had its moments with comedy or comedic points. The antagonist I felt in this was interesting. It was based on magic, which we all know, listeners, you know, with Shazam, that's based on magic as well. Mm -hmm. So, and I look forward to the the next Shazam movie to come out. But, you know, I I appreciated it more on the second watch. But I could tell what everybody else was talking about. And like you were saying before that people were falling asleep (laughs) when they were watching it. It was a long movie. So they didn't really jump to character build as fast as you would want it to be but they put in a lot of scenes in this so there was probably not much editing involved on after the overall this would have been like the director's cut if there is a director's cut how long is that director's cut (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah it definitely like my overall opinion was that it was It was funny because the theme of the movie was the 80s and, you know, more is more, you know, more is not less in the 80s, more is more. And and in this case, the movie had more is more and it was too much. It was bloated. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, we uh, what I did within this point of view when we're doing this, uh, this particular movie, I decided to do pros and cons of the movie, Uh, what my pros were and my cons. They come up a little bit almost equal at certain points and they're reasonable when you think about it when we talk talk about them. So what were your pros on the movie? What did you like? Uh, yeah, let me take a look at my goods here. The whole, actually, first 30 minutes of the movie, the, uh, the Mescrian Iron Woman competition, it kind of called back to Wonder Woman's original origin story mm-hmm. in Wonder Woman, where there's a competition to see which is which of the Amazonians is the strongest and who gets to go to America with Steve Trevor in the comic books. So yes. I thought that was a great nod to the comic books. Mm-hmm. The whole beginning at the mall was very Richard Donner-esque. I know Patty Jenkins is a big fan of yes. Richard Donner. And it had that very 80s nostalgia feel. So the 80s sort of montage in the mall, getting to see all the various mall shops. Um, I wrote down some of the shops that I recognized. Uh, I saw an Orange Julius in there, JCPenney, Lamps Plus, (laughs) some of the (laughs) things you're just not going to get to see anymore. Yeah. 
and uh, the quick scan of Diana's pictures, her the picture gallery in her apartment, um, showing all the friends that she's lost. And it was actually kind of sad. You got to see a picture of her there with at a candy, just kind of understanding her dilemma is being an, an immortal. And maybe that's one of the reasons that she can't connect with mortals is because she has this immortality and she knows whoever she meets, she's eventually going to have to lose. So I love that. I thought all the performances were really good. I liked everybody in their role, but Pedro Pascal was amazing. Yes, I just thought he was. he was so dynamic, um, Over the but top, he was also though. sympathetic. <laughs> yes, but great. Like he was such a showman and that's what he was. He was a con man who like is dynamic on TV and just this, this great showman. But I think he had some great scenes too of where you felt a little sympathy for him, like yes. when his he's with his son and that other his business partner comes up and tells him he's a loser and he's he's just frustrated. He's like, I'm not a loser. And it took a long while for us to see the background of where he came from, mm -hmm. from when he was a kid on the streets, poor, and then him trying to start his own style of business. Mm -hmm. Coming from an abusive family. And exactly. All of and that. It took too long to really get to that point, and that, that's why we kind of didn't show any empathy towards this particular character, even though he is the villain. We don't get that until later on, and I'm like, what, why wouldn't we... I kind of felt that in the scene with his son, though, when he was telling his son he's not yes. a loser. He had this kind of pained look on his face, so I don't know. That's why I immediately felt some sympathy for him, d d regardless of his over-the-top character. <laughs> yeah, that is true. So... One other great is, oh, I like that they show us Diana's intelligence with her vast knowledge of ancient history and languages. Mm -hmm. That's something that Diana's character in the comic books has always had. She's always been a diplomat. She's always been, you know, very intelligent. So I really love that they give that aspect to her in the movies. And I was intrigued by the story of Asteria and really would have liked to see a little bit more of that. And that yeah. final <laughs> scene with Maxwell and his son was super touching. Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah, when you talk about the languages, though, it I, makes me think of the first movie because she mentioned to Steve how many languages she speaks. Mm -hmm. So she's able to do that. She's like, what, you'd only know one language <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> in the first one? But obviously, yeah, it shows exactly how she's been through the years of being within this world and learning all its history and knowing all these aspects of these artifacts, of course, that she knows because she's been around that long. Mm -hmm. So with me, uh, well, the intro scene at Themyscira, it, like you mentioned before, the, the lesson that Diana has to learn within the scene itself with the test. I just love how they introduced that in which, honestly, Warner Brothers told Patty Jenkins to take that out. And mm -hmm. honestly, that is the worst thing that they would ever have done if they did take that out. That yes, was nothing. needed. Yeah, that is the one thing that the Bechdel test is for within film, and that showed just women. You had no talk about men, you had no men in a scene, you had <laughs> nothing, it was all women-based. Mm -hmm. That was the whole point, because as soon as we get into, like, 1984, we get we see Kristen Wiig, and she's dealing with guys and trying to be flirtatious, and then she meets Diana, who's, like, very much offsetting in yeah. the very, you know, within that one scene. So, I thought that was pretty great that we got that scene and it was really needed for young women young girls that are growing up in this day and age to give them a sense of you know strength and power plus it was also a learning lesson for diana that we see later on within the film so it's kind of foreshadowing mm -hmm. and without yeah. it i don't think we would have that it would have been lost and people would have been like okay why this why are they doing this so but yeah i I thought that scene was amazing. And with you, like the overall look of 1984 and pop culture during that time, you know, the way people dressed, especially with Steve Trevor dealing with it, uh -huh. a man at a time. And he's mm -hmm. like, oh, this looks great. And she's like, no. And, she's, <laughs> and he must have dressed like 38 <laughs> times. Uh, definitely the music within the movie that just brought me back to that particular time. You know, I'm not a huge pop fan of 80s music, and as I've gotten older, even though I grew up around it, I tend to, you know, appreciate more and more. And I take it one issue with that one, though. Um, sure. Uh, Mark, because I, 
I listened on the second watch. I'm like, was there any 80s music in there? Was there? Because, you know, we've got Strange and uh, Stranger Things where they're always playing great songs from the 80s. And mm-hmm. just recently I watched um, The Haunting of Bly Manor that took place in the 80s. And they had a, even a few 80s songs in there. I did not hear one single 80s song. It was this. all in the background. It, it was well, actually very light. I did hear light. sort of a Frankie goes to Hollywood kind of sound going on at the party, mm-hmm. but I could not hear any. And this would be the perfect opportunity to throw in, you know, like a Def Leppard or uh, a yeah. New Order. I mean, I loved the New Order song they used in the trailer with yes. the first trailer that came out, New uh, Blue Monday. Mm-hmm. So I, that's that was a big disappointment for me that they did not yeah. throw a single '80s song in there. A lot of it was kind of eluded, I think. You're right in, in some respect. But the uh, the soundtrack itself doesn't, you know, the one that I have and I got was just basically the overall soundtrack. And what I heard within it was pretty much, I might have been on a rights issue with Warner Brothers with trying to get all these 80s songs and it wasn't budgeted in. But mm-hmm. it gave you the the feel of the synthesizers in the back, like with the party scene that Cheetah goes to. You know, mm-hmm. she goes there and then every, she's getting all the looks. You have that music in the back and it's very faint. And there is one eighty song in that. And then same thing during the montage with uh, with Diana and, and Steve when going through all the the suits and the, the clothing that he had to wear. So, yeah, they, yeah, you're right in that aspect. I didn't really pay too much attention. But the one thing that they did bring back was the fanny pack. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> and that was funny. And I, I was researching, trying to figure out, was that 1984? And apparently it was available within the early 80s. I think they said around 1982 where I read it. And it didn't really become prominent until like maybe 85, 86. And it became... I'm trying to remember when I got my fanny pack. <laughs> yeah, I know. But it seems to be a, a something that led all the way into the 90s, too. It kind of mm-hmm. dwindled out and then slowly made its comeback within the past 10 years too because you do see the rock wearing one every once in a while (laughs) (laughs) but you know the next one i i would say uh, a little bit of information i liked was the fact that we get diana creating the invisible jet Mm -hmm. we get that that's something that we always wanted to see as far as having an invisible jet but honestly they did that you you knew about that from the super fans you knew about that from the linda carter tv series but it was kind of campy if you think about it and Mm -hmm. they wanted to make this as um you can't really make the superhero movies realistic but came close to something within reality so with certain sort of magics he was able to do something and the humorous part about that scene is is that she he goes oh you've done this before she goes yes i did it with a coffee cup and i still can't find it (laughs) so (laughs) And that yeah. scene itself was amazing for the fact because it was really meant to be seen on the big wide screen and like IMAX mm-hmm. because of what they see when they're going through all the fireworks yeah. and everything behind them. It's meant to be experienced that way. And seeing it at your home, yeah, unless you have like a true Atmos system with a nice like projector screen in your house or maybe close to that an 85 inch OLED TV and mm-hmm. the nice surround sound system you wouldn't really appreciate it me i only have like a 65 oled i do have a 7.1 system it showed up as at most when i played it but i wanted more big and grand so i'm hoping if they do a re-release during the summer when everything starts to slow down a bit with what everything that's going on in the real world i'm hoping to go out and see that i would yeah. love to see it in an imax theater just to revisit that that one scene particularly but i i thought it was pretty cool that they gave her that ability to make the plane invisible so we got that one aspect out of it and that's one of the things i really loved i really wonder what kind of effect not getting to watch this in the theater had on a lot of viewers because i really feel like if you were in a big theater with surround sound surrounded by a bunch of fellow fans people would have had a much different reaction than they did Mm, yeah, def- yeah, it's a lot of people are getting used to, to the idea of watching these things at home and then nitpicking about certain things. <laughs> but there are those people that are available and they can go out to the theater. Now, mind you, it does suck to sit in a theater. You have to wear a mask. You have to be so far apart and it's limited seating. Mm-hmm. I have not done it yet, but I don't know of anybody else who have actually tried to do that. 
I went to one drive-in this year during the summer, and that was it. And it was for an older film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to got to go see Jurassic Park for the umpteenth time, and and see that. But I, I didn't see any new films. All the new films that I've seen are on my TV. Mm -hmm. So I really miss the cinema, and that's what this movie needed was to be out in the cinemas and experience that way. Yeah. So, it was definitely a summer popcorn movie that we had to watch at home at Christmas. <laughs> yeah, at Christmas. <laughs> I guess they figured with everybody being home for the holidays, everybody anticipating it, the family will sit around and watch it. Mm -hmm. Well, the the best thing in the movie, that another good thing that I loved about the movie is the action scenes were done very well. The scene where Diana and Steve go after the caravan for, you know, when for Max, when mm -hmm. he's in that other country. And he was trying to manipulate the the oil king, whoever it mm -hmm. was. The The whole sequence was really good. Her powers were a little weak due to Deborah taking that part of her in some way. So we got yeah. a little bit of that aspect. It showed a weakness for Diana to, for just a little bit. But her heart with saving those kids from being run over, that was really cool. And the little things mm -hmm. that she said, it's like, you didn't see this. <laughs> it's yes. like, I, that was pretty cool. And the fact that it was like her saving kids. Yeah. And I love the wink that she gives to the little girl in the mall when yes. she's, she's fighting the bad guys and the, the little girl goes out there and it's like, wow. And she tucks her into that giant teddy bear. And yep, gives she her just a wink. takes a slide into it. And then, <laughs> hi. <laughs> I did love that part too. It was very cute. The, the scene where Steve tells Diana to go, that was so intense. That was really driven, and that's what the movie needed. Uh, on the second watch, it was a little emotional for me because mm -hmm. it really tugs at the heartstrings. And, you know, a lot of people are throwing those issues out there. It's like, well, she he only he, – they were together for a little bit back in World War II and blah, blah, blah. And, you know – he she had a crush on this guy and he's been dead for how many years and i'm like really come on <laughs> well i that's uh, you know that goes a little into my bad but i will say that i was really surprised that they killed steve trevor in the first movie i mean it was one of it was the most emotional scene of the first movie and i loved it but i was really surprised that they killed him because steve trevor is diana's lois lane you know yes. they are the love story that has endured through the Wonder Woman stories. And there are actually times during the comic books where, where Steve ages and she doesn't. And mm -hmm. I, it, I just find it a little interesting and I, they didn't approach it in the movie, but it's nice to theorize about like, you know, how deeply do you love someone when you are immortal and you know that, you know, they're, life is very fleeting compared to yours and you know perhaps that love sinks in a lot deeper for her because yes. she knows it's so brief and she has the memory and she still continues kind of like the highlander if mm -hmm. you think about it yeah uh, to coin uh, another <laughs> 80s movie that i love so yeah but the cool thing about that one scene though is as she pushes herself away having forcing herself to leave him at that point you, she started to feel her power after taking back her wish f for Steve, mm -hmm. then using the lasso as a way to propel her, you know, and to fly in some sort of way, freeing herself. The way she was projected was showing as if she was freeing herself from mm -hmm. everything, releasing the hate really is driven at that point and not feeling that she's held on to because of him, because that was what was holding her back. So a lot of people you know, see that as it being it being a weak point in the movie. I don't think so. I think it was mm -hmm. something that was needed. So, and yeah, then I didn't think their relationship was a weak point. It was the way that it came about that I didn't love. But it was done magically. If you think about it, it wasn't even his body. Every time they didn't really point that out because he would see himself in the mirror. He see himself as the mm -hmm. other guy. But whenever time, anytime she saw him, she saw Steve. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure anybody else around looked at him and said, that's that guy. That's not that guy in the picture, Steve Trevor. But I think they kind of alluded to that in one scene, which I, I believe Kristen Wiig's it's character. It's when he's looking in the mirror. Oh, I thought it was when he's looking in the mirror and he's like making faces at himself. Yes. He's like, yeah, this isn't bad, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know. He sees that he sees another body, another person there. 
Yeah, he sees it, but my thought was if anybody else seeing him and who has seen that picture, because Kristen Wiig's character, Deborah, I think it is, uh, she mm -hmm. winds up like going, oh, 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 like as if she recognized him. And they don't, you didn't get to see through her eyes what she sees. Is it Steve or is it the other guy? Because this mm. is magic at hand. So. I think she just, uh, something piqued her interest when Diana told her he was a pilot. Because yes, she told yeah, her that I the man yeah, that, he, that she was in love with was a pilot. That might have been a, a gimme to get mm -hmm. to that point, you know? Like, oh, you're going back to pilots. You like those pilot guys. <laughs> She's really into pilots. <laughs> <laughs> My last one would be the the Linda Carter cameo as Asteria. Yes. Uh, yeah, we got the history about her as an Amazonian. We get her armor, which we see Diana Don to go after Cheetah and Max. That was really awesome within the fight scenes itself with Cheetah. But seeing Linda Carter, who I had, you know, as a kid, had a crush on from mm -hmm. her as Wonder Woman. And I'm sorry, listeners, if you see Linda Carter now, and I'm not just talking just on that particular scene, she has a beautiful voice. Mm -hmm. She sings and, and does jazz work, jazz music. And it's amazing. I tried to reach out to her people and I <laughs> didn't get a response because <laughs> I did it literally about a month before the movie was finally saying, we're dropping this now. I really wanted to talk to Linda Carter. <laughs> but the fact is, is that you know, we finally get representation from something that came before. You know, we got the Linda Carter Wonder Woman. Now she's there to play a character within this universe. And the woman has not aged. I, she's beautiful. <laughs> she's still a beautiful woman. You and mm -hmm. she's been in other movies, not just this one. She's been in Super Troopers too. <laughs> she's been in a, a few other movies. Throughout. It, it's pretty interesting. She was actually in the Dukes of Hazard, if you remember that too. Wow, no, I never. We watched that as kids, and I never remember seeing. No, her. no, no. The movie, The Dukes of Hazzard. Oh, the movie. Okay, <laughs> I think I saw that. If I did, it was just once, so I'd have to go back. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was really cool. I'm like, this woman never ages. And I think she mentioned it in, in an interview once. She, somebody mentioned, it's like, you never age. She goes, well, I have to leave that to my Mexican heritage. <laughs> and I'm like, Lovely. Well, yeah. I love and that she's she winked, wink, too. Because, yeah, she uh, winked. Yep, Wonder that's Woman that... always gave the little wink. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. So now we got our pros out of the way glorifying it i have a few cons but mm -hmm. do you have a few cons based upon what we uh what you've seen in the movie okay <laughs> got some bads here you got some and, bad ones i mean <laughs> they're not horrible i mean so many people if you look online you'd think that this was the worst movie of the year and i didn't think so i no. i really no i enjoyed it um it didn't live up to my expectations, but maybe I thought maybe my expectations were too high after such a great first initial movie. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, like I said, was getting a little um, down on it on my first watch, but I think that was the environment I was in and watching it by myself. I enjoyed it a lot more. So here's a few of the cons that I had. I liked Diana finally finding a new gal pal after losing Etta. I mm -hmm. imagine she was with Etta for a very long time until she passed away. And then she was probably lonely for a while. So mm -hmm. it was nice to have um, Barbara Minerva show up and be her big gal pal. <laughs> yep. But I felt that their relationship was really rushed. I didn't get to feel any depth to it. Yeah. They just go, they talk a little bit at work and then they go out for a quick dinner and uh, Diana rescues her from the belligerent drunk. But yeah. I mean, I did not feel that connection and it would have been, really been nice to have that connection. Like the connection she had with her, her gang in the first movie, you know, I felt her have a connection with each one of those characters and I don't know if it was just the the writing or what that they, it just didn't give them an oppor opportunity to show how you know instantly close they became. Yeah, it's because it was only a few scenes, and then Barbara grows this attachment towards Diana, wanting and longing to be her, and that was mm -hmm. her wish. But yeah, and you bring that was a little uh, single white female to me. 
<laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> and then on top of that, you mentioning Etta too, because uh, we get to, all we see is a picture of Etta. We mm-hmm. never the only thing that we got out of the first film with Etta was for the fact that she was showing you know Diana all these these dresses and everything that she had to get her ready, Ooh, and mm-hmm. it's like she loves her poppiness. You didn't grasp, you know, there was no flashback of hey, this was their relationship, and then you could be like Diana, be like thinking as she's with Barbara, maybe to a flashback of a friend that she had that was female that she over the years even after steve it would Mm -hmm. have been nice to have something just a little snippet but that would be me saying hey release the director's cut (laughs) (laughs) because you know they have to have something a little something there but if they decided to do that that would be great because the movie itself was like over two and a half hours long Oh so. yeah, which leads me to my other bad, which I meant to, I said to you that this story was just bloated. It had too many, too many elements. Um, the first movie had a nice economy to it that kept the mm. storyline simple and the pace moving, but this one tried to incorporate another Diana flash, flashback in Themyscira, which was needed, but yes. then a Cheetah backstory, a Maxwell Lord backstory, a Trevor, uh, Steve Trevor resurrection story, an Hysteria <laughs> story, an eighties nostalgia bit about the oil barons and consumerism and the cold world, cold war. And it was just like, this is too much. You know? yeah. I mean, trim it down. It was just, it was just trying to throw everything at you. And it's, I, in my opinion, made the story just a bit too convoluted. And I actually liked the Diana scene in, in teaching her to fly. And I liked the scene with the invisible jet. But I feel like we should have got one or the other, not both in the fr- in the second movie. There's a third coming up, so I don't know why they couldn't have put that into the third movie. W- one of those. Uh, I think Patty Jenkins pushed a little bit more into it because she wanted to show more of what Diana mm-hmm. can have. Because literally, all we saw her in a very in her very first role on th- on and on the screen that we know of is with Batman versus Superman. She comes in, mm-hmm. she's like taking out, you know can keep up with the boys at that point Mm -hmm. you know and with this with the first movie we get the uh the information of who diana is we get to know her and then by justice league she's more incorporated she's more modern by that time but of course it's considered modern age but she's still in love with steve and she's still in love with steve (laughs) that guy that she met 40 some odd years or or 50 or 60 some odd years ago yeah (laughs) 60 some but the, yeah. the, the cool thing with the Themyscira thing, though, honestly, you know, I I love the ideas of all the different women who are playing Amazonians and the fact that we got a little bit more of Robin Wright, got mm-hmm. more Princess Bride on screen, and she still looked great as she did in the first film, too. So that was yeah. – and honestly, I still think that was definitely needed. They they should shoot oh, yeah. themselves I, in the I, arm. Yeah, they definitely did that. I just – maybe there were other – well, actually, I know what they could have trimmed out more. Um, but on top of this huge convoluted story, they have some sort of nameless god of mischief that yes. basically caused the entire chaos of the story. And you hear about him for two minutes and he doesn't even get a name. Or we don't even get a flashback history of who he really is, <laughs> no. what happened to him. And, you know, it, it just that I had a little bit of a problem with that, too, because she just sees it at the very bottom of whatever, a little ring mm-hmm. or metal piece that was where the crystal was. Yeah. And she, right away, then she realizes, and then she just gives a brief information, and then it goes on. I agree with that. We don't even know what God is. She she looks at it, and it says, oh, it's in the language of the gods. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Like, we're going to get some God action here like Detail. we did in the last, music, <laughs> last movie. And no, no, it doesn't even get a name. <laughs> so you had a couple of others too i see yeah um really the my biggest problem and i think it's a lot of people's problem is the way that steve trevor was brought back i mean yeah he had such great chemistry at, with uh well um gal gadot and and chris prine have really chris, good chris chemistry prine yeah. and gal gadot have really great chemistry together and i just feel like there were some executives at warner brothers who sat down and said okay what worked in the first movie okay steve trevor and and wonder bring woman we need to bring them back together <laughs> i don't care how you do it you got to bring them back and when i saw the trailers and i knew he was coming back i'm like oh gosh i really hope he's just coming back as kind of like a thought in her head or some, you know, sort of thing that comes back to her when she needs his inspiration or something like that. Yeah. But no, they, they brought him back. <laughs> I'm okay that they brought him back with magic. I heard that Patty Jenkins was a fan of 
Heaven Can Wait, where yes. um, Warren Beatty's character comes back in the body of a man in a coma. Mm-hmm. So I think she wanted to do that, but I don't think it was the greatest idea. Like, if this magical stone can raise up walls in the desert and can, you know, create missiles out of nowhere, why couldn't they create or just bring Steve Trevor's body back? <laughs> just bring him back. Why do they have to body snatch this poor, you know, innocent man who has no idea that his body is just being used and like sent off to Egypt to possibly be killed and everything. <laughs> like I I didn't love that. And I just to me, it felt like bringing him back. I, and I realized he would probably have to somehow die again at the end. But mm. it kind of lessened his sacrifice from the first movie for me. Exactly. For the fact that it's like, oh, she's still torn, too. Because if you look at Justice League, mm-hmm. when she talks, when you know, when Ben Affleck as uh, Bruce Wayne says, oh, did you talk to you? <laughs> Is this your feeling about Mr. Trevor, and she just like throws him out. (laughs) It's like, really? It's Mm -hmm. like, it it felt better when we just had that one story from the first film and then not have him available within this. But I guess for story purposes of pushing the uh, the character for love and everything else and being at a balance of what we were getting with Barbara, you know, and wanting Mm -hmm. and needs. So I guess they they had to put that in there because they didn't... what were they going to do? Put in a new love interest at mm-hmm. that point? And I, I don't, it would have felt short. Know. Maybe they wouldn't need another love interest and it, she could have developed her relationship with Barbara a little more. Mm. Yeah, it, it could have been, well, then it would have been really a single white female. <laughs> oh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, for mine, well, I felt the movie was, I've said it before, a little bit too long for me. I, I know that they wanted it to knock, it, to get it knocked out at a park with people, but the like you and I both stated, uh, the movie was a little bit too drawn out with some scenes. Mm-hmm. You know, they could have, you know, lowered the amount of time within those scenes themselves instead of dragging yeah, I, them out. I kind of liked your man out of time with Steve um, experiencing the 80s, yeah. but him, like, you know, t- trying on the 80s clothes and everything. That was the same gag with the first movie, but with him and Diana reversed. So yes. I was like, mm, don't play that gag again. Do something different. Well, it's very similar to the gags that they did with uh, within this film. Just like they did it in the first film, just short. When Diana saves Steve, she stops the bullet with her mm-hmm. bracelet. And this one, uh, it's all the comical stuff that like you would see in Superman two mm-hmm. or Superman three at that point, and back in the eighties uh, when those movies came out, or late seventies, eighties, uh, early eighties. But the uh, you know Donner was a uh, big, you know, but had a big thing with gags in movies, and they did that especially with Steve Trevor during the he, he picks up the bike. Say, mm-hmm. I try to ride my way to where you work, but I didn't know how to get this thing out the door. <laughs> Yeah, and that it's was an funny. exercise standalone sex. That him with the the trash can. It's mm-hmm. like she's showing him art, it's and he goes, "That's that's that's art. That's art." That's and that art. was funny, but they gave that away in the trailer. They like, did. Oh, they shouldn't have given that one away in the trailer. Yeah, but yeah, you know, to add on to some of the other things, I wasn't sure of, and what what didn't really like was would be the long shots of cgi on Kristen wig that was just bad uh, for cheetah mm-hmm. you know you would think a, a, a movie of this scope and this budget the the effects would be as good as what we get on the mandalorian or a star wars film at that mm-hmm. the close-up shots were really really good because I think they were more practical with makeup effects especially mm-hmm. when you know when diana takes you know, Barbara out of the water and she's still cheetah and you get a, a closer look at Kristen Wiig's face when they are face to face right in front of each other. You mm-hmm. see that is her. It's not a CGI effect. So I, I think they should have worked and paid more attention to all these things that they, they were putting into these effects for that because the movie prided on the idea that they were we were going to get a cheetah. Mm-hmm. And it and I would not be surprised if we get Cheetah again. Yeah, and the, the, Cheetah's, according to like DC lore, she's one of the fastest characters in the DC universe behind yes. you know some of the flashes and stuff. But 
when she ran in the White House, she did not look like she was running really fast. She didn't have that kind of flash effect where Flashy you, you kind of yeah. yeah you can see the trails behind him or anything. She she didn't feel to me like she was running super fast. Maybe it's because she was just learning her power. I'm I'm Maybe. not trying to justify it, but <laughs> I'm thinking in the in in a sense that when if we do get more of her later on, mm-hmm. uh, we'll get more of that later on. You know, I'm not talking yeah. about you know her in the Legion of Doom with Luthor and the rest of them. <laughs> oh man, I want the Legion of Doom. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I back want at the that, Legion of I Doom. I want that Darth Vader style <laughs> yeah. headquarters in the swamp. <laughs> the Doom headquarters, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please give us that Patty Jenkins. <laughs> yeah, I would love to see that a little bit. A little bit of me and that, that kid who loved the Super Friends. And yes. you can actually still see those. They're on YouTube, so. Nice. Well, um, I agree with you with the makeup, though. Some people complained that she looked like one of the cast of Cats, but I thought she looked great. Actually, it looked better than... The most recent Cats movie, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think I thought she looked like a badass in her final Cheetah transformation. It, the transformation and everything else was really good. Deep down, it was good. The close-ups, like I said, it's just the long-distance shots look too animated to me. Mm-hmm. And they yeah. had more time and budgetary. And I'm sorry, delaying a movie this long, they could have gone back and re-edited those shots. Yeah. Just to give us a little bit more and just get what we were expecting. So... What about uh, Diana's running scenes, though? When she's running, and it looks like she's running on a wire, do you think that was because they were being cheap with the CGI, or do you think they were trying to do a throwback to how they had Wonder Woman running in the 70s uh, TV show? Hmm. That's a good question. And it looked like, yeah, it looked like she was on a track or something, and they were just pushing her forward to do it. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I, I... it did look a little bit off, but now that, yeah, now that I think about it, it does look a little off. It <laughs> might have been something towards the fact that they were trying to, like you were saying, go towards, like, re- refer to the 1970s Wonder Woman show. Yeah. Because when I was watching it the second time, I'm like, that looks a lot like how they made her and, like, the bionic woman and the million dollar man run back in the 70s. Well, well if you always watch the bionic man and the bionic woman, they would always do that low mm-hmm. <laughs> slow yep, yep. run <laughs> but with her it was it we, we were seeing the speed as it were and everybody being a blur behind them so with visual effects nowadays it was a lot easier mm-hmm. uh the last one i would have would be the you know though the scenes of max lord were a bit too long they were okay yeah but i i think they they could have been shortened mm-hmm. to some degree you know, on his way to power with the the crystals or God's power that he obtained with the wish. Yeah, and Pedro Pascal was very good at it. I, I thought I a lot of people are not into him as playing other characters. If you know, because they've seen him on Game of Thrones and he's the Mandalorian now. But I I thought it was a little over the a, a little over the top at times. You know, a little humorous to me, similar to Chris Reeve's Superman series and and his villains in the seventies and the early eighties. You know, you know, you think about Luthor and how act, you know, crazy they were, and how mm-hmm. they acted, how over the top they were. Yeah. You know, and the lack of information about the crystal, we agree. Yeah, you know, that to mm-hmm. me is the come on. It was, it was a perfect point to have like a big backstory of big bad that's in the movie, mm-hmm. and we got that from the last one because she talked about the God of War. And yeah. what do we get at the end? <laughs> so it's like, okay. <laughs> but we don't see a visual look of this particular, you know. I know. He destroyed the entire Mayan civilization and we get no story on him whatsoever. And I was thinking of the entire Greek pantheon, which p- plays a lot into the Wonder Woman stories. There's not really a god of mischief like there is in Norse no. mythology with Loki. There's Pan and he can be mischievous, but yeah. he can't turn objects into... um you know, Vessels tools of, of destruction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I just thought that was weird that it, like, the entire story kind of hinged on this magical object, and yet we hear nothing about the god that created it. <laughs> exactly. It's like, oh, we'll talk about this guy, but we'll never see him. We'll just hand wave we'll it just, away. It's We'll good. just hand it off. Yeah, hand it off. <laughs> All right. Well, th- those were our thoughts on on the movie Wonder Woman 1984. Now we're going to just move on to quotes. So we have a little fun with this at times. Do you have any quotes from the movie that you liked, Lara? 
Yeah, I've got a couple. Um, <laughs> my first one is uh, when she's talking to Maxwell Lord and she tell he's he's uh, telling her, trying to get her to recognize him from the TV. And mm. she says, I don't have a TV. And his response is, I can get you a brand new TV by the end of the day, 19 inches, no strings attached. And Diana's response is, I'll stick to the TV I don't have. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's a good one. <laughs> and then my other one that I laughed out loud at is when they're taking off on the jet and um diana just uh kind of forgets to mention to steve about radar and yes. Steve says to her well will they shoot us well shit diana <laughs> <laughs> i just love that he talks to her like they're a regular couple, couple. i mean she's a demigod and he's just like I well know. shit diana <laughs> That was great. I think that was pure Chris Pine right there. That was, and it worked out. But that was also in the plane, too. So it was one of my <laughs> favorite scenes. So I love that. <laughs> well, I have a couple myself. So one would be from Diana. And she goes, so you went to my apartment? And then Steve goes, yeah, I tried to use the bike at first. I couldn't really figure out how to use it, get it going. So I ran over and saw you come back. And I was stunned. There you were. So I just followed you like a creep. And then Diana, look at you. It's not. It's like one day has passed. And then Diana goes, I can't say the same thing about you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Poor Steve. At least he landed in a handsome man's body, because I think that's what the guy gets credited for in the credits is the handsome, handsome man. Handsome guy body. Of all things, yeah. <laughs> too, you, you know that actors can be like, really, dude? Can I have like... <laughs> yeah, hopefully it was top billing, but probably not. He's probably lower down in the scale. Give the poor fellow a name, at least. <laughs> yep. Well, the next one and the last one I have would be Antiope saying, and this is to young Diana, and she, she goes, you cannot be the winner because you are not ready to win. And there's no shame in that. Only in knowing the truth in your heart and not accepting it. No true hero is born from lies. So without them having that, if they took that whole Themyscira intro out mm -hmm. of the movie and it just went in like we were talking about, it would have been the worst thing because this is what guided her in this movie, if you think mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, you can't get anything by cheating or using shortcuts. Exactly. So, well, we're on heading towards the end and Steve couldn't make it tonight. So what we're going to do is we're going to play what Steve has sent us. So uh, he uh, sent us uh, some... A voicemail of all things so I'm gonna share that and we'll listen to that now hey Mark and Laura this is Steve and uh, so sorry that I can't be with you guys uh, tonight for this this Wonder Woman 1984 review but uh, so I'll, I'll just throw in a few of my thoughts real quick not to take up too much time I really enjoyed the movie the first time I watched it the second time with all of the the criticism that I heard from other people kind of bothered me a little bit but overall, I still enjoyed it, even the second time. And I love that cameo scene at the end that we get with Linda Carter. It's just amazing uh, to see her. And, like, as soon as I saw her from behind, I knew who it was. Like, it, there, there was no doubt in my mind that it was going to be Linda Carter and, uh, and that she was going to be Hysteria. I thought that was so super cool. But uh, a few of the things that I, that I really did like, I actually liked the predictability of it because – a lot of 80s movies were predictable, so it, it didn't bother me all that much that there was some predictability to it. I loved when Diana and and Barbara are at the party, and Diana is dressed in white, and Barbara is dressed in black. It's so very clear who the villain is and who the, the hero is. So I, I really like that part of it. I, I love the – just how we, we could see – the the corruption the degre the degradation of Barbara's character as she became less and less human and became more and more of that kind of predator thing and uh, the only you know, I do have a few criticisms of it I didn't like this the whole quantum leap thing of of uh, Steve jumping into some other guy's body that just it, it, the movie didn't make it clear. I also didn't like the inconsistency with the wish power uh, with Pedro Fasal. Because sometimes he would just ask somebody, well, do you want me to do this, right? And, and you wish for me to do this. And they'd be like, yes. So uh, anyway, can't wait to hear you guys talk about it. Have a great time. And I will talk to you later. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. I love the idea he throws in Quantum Leap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's Dr. Sam Beckett. <laughs> He's going to pop into this body for a few days. 
Yeah. And yeah, I think he's right in that aspect too. Well, thank you, mm -hmm. Steve. Uh, we wished you could have been here, <laughs> but you'll get to hear what we thought. I think we went on a little bit further than we thought we would. Usually these take about a half hour or so, but we decided to go a little longer. So with that, uh, we're going to move into some comic news. So with that, we have WandaVision is going to be released on January 15th of 2021. Yay! It's going to be on Disney+. Nice. Plus. Something I'm looking forward to, and I can't wait to see this. It will be two episodes that will drop that particular day. So, listeners, if you're going to watch and send us feedback, please just indicate which episode you're regarding. We're not sure if we're going to be recording them individually or doing the bulk of the two episodes yet. So, if you could do that, it'd be great. Plus, we are getting Snowpiercer Season 2 come January 25th on TNT, and we've already mentioned this. So, we know that the, the WandaVision is going to be overlapping. So, Steve and I might just alternate on <laughs> who covers what, or we might combine them. We're not sure yet, but we will notify you guys what we're going to do, because it's it's two things that we both are anticipating that's coming up and it's funny how they all come up at the same time so look forward to that when that comes out so at the very end we always love to give podcast recommendations so lara do you have any that you would like to recommend sure i don't do any podcast thing myself but um as this in it, uh movie involved a lot of mythology into it i am a huge fan of mythology so there's a bunch of fun podcasts out there that I listen to, including the Myths and Legends podcasts, Mythology and Fiction Explained, and Tales of the British Isles. And maybe if I listen to that, I'll find out who this mysterious god of mischief is. <laughs> yeah, see where they pulled that from. <laughs> That'd be cool. Uh, for me, well, Run For Your Lives with Paik and Daphne on the Pyrocore Entertainment. They cover those big monster movies. Right now they're covering some disaster films as well. So check them out. Adrenaline Cinema Podcast, which is my other podcast. And you can find that on the Pyrocore Entertainment Network as well. By the time this comes out, you should be hearing a review of the movie Aliens. And with that, I have my friends Wendy and Kelly. And they'll be on and we'll be discussing that. So check that out. Strange Indeed on the Podcast Network with Rima and Ben now covering The Stand uh, for CBS All Access. And Paik will be available for a few episodes as well while Ben keeps his seat warm for him. So check nice. that out. But for any of you, if you'd like to submit any of your feedback, all you have to do is go to our Facebook page, which would be facebook.com slash panels to pixels. We'll be putting a post of what we're going to be covering or for what episode of what show we're covering next. Just leave your comments below that particular post. So do that. If not, you could always email us and send us a voicemail message like you just heard Steve do. Mm -hmm. And you could send that to panels to pixels one at gmail.com. And that's panels to spelt out the, the letters T and O and pixels and the number one at gmail.com. So do that. And you could also hear us on Spotify, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. So if there's any way for you to give us a rating, it would be really appreciated. Just be honest. Throw us a, a rating and a review, and we'll be happy about that. So we could also be found on YouTube as well. I convert all these audio files and put them with an image, and you could hear that. If you like to go to YouTube and listen to your podcast, that's where it will be. It would be Panels to Pixels Podcast. So check that out. Just do the search, and we'll be there. Each episode will be there as well. You could actually put in comments in YouTube as well. So, and where else can listeners hear us? Well, since Steve's not here, you could hear him on other people's podcasts when he sends feedback because he just loves to watch TV and get in touch with his friends. So he loves being on there. And I do believe he did a podcast earlier, either not today, but yesterday. And it's on the Podcastica Network. I think he was covering Cobra Kai season three, one of the Ooh. episodes there. So we'll keep you aware of when and that will be coming out. So check Steve out on that. So with me, you could also hear me on, like I stated before, Adrenaline Cinema Podcast, and that would be found on the Pyrocore Entertainment Network. So you could check out all my movie reviews of action movies, adventure movies, 
suspense and thrilling movies. So check those out at that location. So, well, with that, I just want to thank everybody for listening. I'm Mark. I'm Laura. And this was Panels to Pixels, and we'll see you on the next panel. Good night, everybody. Good night.